As a reminder, please uh, mute yourself if you're not speaking. Okay, Karen, can I start? Okay, great. Welcome, I'm Julie Swan. This is the FITS Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering COVID-19 update on May 29th, 2020 for graduate students. Now, let me say up front, uh, first, thank you for joining. We've got a, a lot of people on the line uh, in live real time, and I'm sure we'll have people view later. Um, but to manage expectations, I won't have all of the answers to the questions that you that you have. So we'll, we'll do what we can to answer as many as we can. I'm also joined by Dr. Yahya Fati. So I will turn to him uh, later in the presentation to help uh, answer the questions that you submitted in advance or submit through the chat function on the Zoom meeting. Thank you very much. <clears throat> this slide covers some of the things that we will be talking about in the in the meeting today, just to give you a sense. So we'll, we'll start first a little bit about background on, on COVID-19. So because that helps also set the stage on some of the protections that campus is putting in place. Um, great, thank you. Uh, so as you probably are aware, the, the virus SARS-CoV-2 causes the disease COVID-19, and this has turned into a global pandemic. Uh, there are a number of different symptoms of this disease, and this symptom list has been added to over time. Uh, so for example, loss of smell was added, diarrhea was added, and then there are other things like fever, coughing, difficulty breathing. Not all cases show symptoms. There are a number of cases that are either mild or asymptomatic, and that's particularly true for young adults like, like many of our graduate students. Uh, so keep that in mind that you could uh, be a carrier of the disease and not even realize it during some, some time periods. The mortality of the COVID-19 disease is about five to 10 times that of influenza. Uh, and there are a number of known risk factors, including increasing age and several specific types of disease conditions. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus is more infection, infectious than influenza, but less infectious than the measles. Uh, so, but it is something that we need to take seriously, uh, in part due to both the infectivity and the asymptomatic nature for many people, as well as the relatively higher mortality rate. It can be transmitted uh, most often through airborne pathways, such as when you're talking closely with someone. Uh, there are both large droplets and small droplets that, that go into the air. Uh, it can be transmitted through fecal contamination as well, uh, such as uh, nor noroviruses and through touching of surfaces, although that last one is thought to be a much smaller risk of transmission than through airborne uh, channels. Uh, as I mentioned, some can be asymptomatic and we, like other diseases, we can also have people who just happen to be super spreaders for one reason or another. So, you know, it, it follows the, the Pareto type of rule where 80% um, of the virus could be spread by 20% of the people. And these resources were taken from the CDC, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and you're encouraged to, to look at that and other official uh, guidance uh, for other questions. Now, to continue with the, the background on COVID-19, uh, in general infection, one way to think about it is exposure to the uh, virus times uh, the time period that you're exposed, and the exposure includes the number of people, the closeness, the airflow, those kinds of things. Uh, the, by, so to reduce transmission, we reduce the number of people in an environment, we reduce the amount of time in environment, we improve the airflow, and we can also wear face coverings, which also help to reduce the transmission of the virus in the air, and cleaning services as well. On the right-hand side, there's a picture from contact tracing of a case that originated in a restaurant, or the first case uh, the person with it was in a restaurant environment. They are marked with the blue X. They then spread it to some other people at their, at their own table who were diagnosed over the next few days. And the virus also spread to other tables nearby, uh, demonstrating that, that airflow aspect. There are also a number of other strategies that public health environments, uh, public health departments and organizations do, including testing for either infections or antibodies 
And if active infections are determined, then doing contact tracing on the close uh, uh, people who have been closest to those uh, infections to try to reduce the transmission beyond that. A population could reach herd immunity for this virus. It's thought to, that it will require at least 60% of the population to have immunity. So we're not, we're not close to that yet in the United States, but over time, it's possible that we would approach that. Uh, new treatments regularly roll out and new experiments are ongoing with vaccines. Uh, we gave a disease modeling seminar earlier today and that will be available online if you're interested. Now let me go back to NC State and let me begin with some of the things that the Chancellor has told people about and has put out there uh, so that you're aware and you'll know how that fits into some of your different questions. So the Chancellor has outlined 10 task forces that are working on planning for the campus. The first one is around academic calendar and planning of classes. I'm on that committee, so I know more about that committee and the decisions that, that the committee is looking at than I do the other committees. But there are committees across all different areas. You'll see there's one on student activities, uh, housing is in the, the mix, uh, dining is in the mix, and so um, all of these different areas around the campus are being looked at for how operations should be stood up so that they uh, promote the, the health and safety of the campus. And, and keep in mind that this health and safety includes the students who are uh, essential for the campus. Um, typically, most of our students are at lower risk for severe outcomes from COVID-19. We also have our faculty and staff. Some of these may be at higher risk. And then we also have the community around the campus, and that's part of this, this broader campus network. Each of these uh, task force groups has been asked to have some preliminary planning documents drafted uh, by next week, uh, but have a final approved plan by early July. Now things continue to change every day. Uh, so, so what the committee uh, was told a couple of days ago, uh, we then may have additional information, you know, yesterday some additional information came out. So these things are continuing to change and continuing to update as uh, science improves on, on COVID-19, as guidance changes from the state or from federal agencies, uh, or new creative, innovative ideas uh, arise. <clears throat> In addition to the, the, the task force list, uh, the chancellor has announced a number of other things about the calendar that I wanna point out. The calendar will begin on August 10th, that is earlier than scheduled. Now this is primarily driven for, by promoting the health and safety of the, the broader campus community. One thing that we know is that when, when people start in one location and then they go somewhere else and they mix with others, whether that's in the, the airport or at someone's house or someone else, somewhere else, and then they come back to that first location, there's the potential for them to bring a, a virus back to that first location. So because of that, the uh, campus will end by Thanksgiving, including finals. And this is being done at a number of campuses, both in North Carolina and in other parts of the US. In addition, the breaks were removed from the fall calendar, um, partly to reduce the potential for virus transmission from the, com from the campus to the outside community and from the outside community back to the campus. Now this is hard. This is hard for students, and I can tell you that, that faculty and staff won't love it either because it does impact them. Um, however, this is done with the, the best purpose in mind, which is that, that health and safety of the community. Right now, the, the Chancellor has said that winter commencement plans will be left to decide until later. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that even if the university doesn't have uh, winter commencement plans, uh, if, if, if the university is not able to have, hold something in person, we will, do, we will follow their guidance, but we will also do some kind of virtual celebration as we did this spring to celebrate with our graduates while simultaneously inviting them to come back uh, for a, a later commencement in person. So uh, faculty are aware of these changes and they are, you know, certainly I ask them to keep in mind the stress and anxiety of students uh, and that, that stress that may be elevated because reduced breaks and, and those kinds of things. And so, so faculty are aware of this. Let me talk a little bit more about this campus committee on, on academic calendar and some of the decisions that this committee is uh, examining now. 
Uh, so certainly the overall calendar for the fall was the first uh, decision that we've been looking at. Uh, we're simultaneously looking at a calendar for the spring as well, knowing that there's a good chance the virus will still be circulating. The group is looking at the timing of classes throughout the day and the length of classes towards thinking about ways to reduce the exposure to virus and reduce transmission. Shorter classes may be better than longer classes, but we also have to be careful about the transition between classes when you might get a lot of students in Daniels Hall on the second floor, for example. We will have some classes in person, we will have some classes online, and we will have some classes that are hybrid. So we're currently going through a process to prioritize which of those methods best fit the content and pedagogy of that, that class material. We're also trying to balance so that students across different levels, different the levels of undergrad, graduate, different levels within that, all have the opportunity for uh, in-person classes if they desire. The group is also looking at locations for classes, uh, taking existing classes and trying to spread them out. There's also a hybrid model uh, that we, we will be using where um, some of the students would come to class on Tuesday, some of the students would come to class on Thursday, and on the day when you're not there physically, you would be joining remotely. And that allows students to interact directly with that professor, to ask questions, which creates a more vibrant campus a, a more vibrant classroom learning structure but um, we're enabling that while still uh, adhering to distancing rules there's also being increased technology added to support classroom instruction so we're adding more cameras throughout the campus to make it easier to record the lectures that, that professors are giving so that if you are sick or quarantined uh, and cannot come to class you would still be able to access that class material uh, the group is talking about the spaces around classrooms like halls and stairwells and doors and where students might be waiting uh, while they're, they're waiting for a class to start. And the group is also talking about contingency planning for things like if there's a hurricane and we have to miss a day of class, then how does that impact the schedule? Or contingency if, if something changes uh, with the virus. The group is also looking at personal protective equipment and like, like face coverings and, and other hardware like, uh, like plexiglass uh, to support safety throughout uh, the academic environments. There are also other groups that are looking at that issue, so that's not the primary focus of this group. And the group is talking about the grading policies. If you were here in spring, you know that there were some changes to grading policies in, in the spring uh, to make it easier for students to adjust to that. Uh, different framework for the spring. I am anticipating there will probably be some of those types of grading policies in place for fall, but the deadlines might be tightened up a little bit and not, not be quite as extended as they were for the spring semester when there was so much uncertainty and disruption uh, in the middle of that semester. I do encourage you to continue to uh, submit your questions in the chat and we will come to that uh, when we can. The provost has also sent an email out and he asked each of the instructors of record to prepare contingency plans for the fall for each of their courses. So the memo specifically talks about physical distancing, what to do if students are on quarantine orders, what to do if the instructor becomes quarantined, uh, address county or state stay at home orders, internet reliability, communications, technology, et cetera. There's a specific template for the uh, contingency plans that each instructor is expected to use. And you can see the things that it covers there, including communications, distrib distribution of materials, delivery of lectures, et cetera. So it is my, uh, and these are, will be submitted to the department head. We review them for clarity and sharing of best practices and to make sure that they address all that we think they need to address. So I am encouraging all instructors to find a way to make their, um, their lectures available online for students who are not able to attend class due to COVID-19. Now, if you chose to go to the beach and skip class, I'm not promising that that lecture is available to you, but that's just like it would be in any semester. 
Uh, the, the next slide has several resources that I've been looking at uh, and others, but these are just the ones from the last week that are looking at some of the different things that colleges across the United States are doing, for example, in that second article. And these provide ideas uh, for things that, that could be implemented here. Uh, and the last one is some guidance from the CDC about how to reopen colleges and universities. So um, the policies around uh, personal protective equipment like face coverings are not entirely clear right now. We know that in research labs, they are required that that guidance has come out. Uh, and they are certain, certainly encouraged in all inside settings like classrooms. Uh, we do not know what level of requirement will be placed on that right now. But I can tell you that I think it's really important. Um, and for me, you know, a face covering, I, I have one here. This is about when I wear a mask, it's about protecting you because this is keeping the virus particles from, from spreading to someone else, even if I didn't know I had the disease, but I was asymptomatic. And so that's pretty important, right? That's in, and we need a lot of people to be doing that so that the virus transmission drops in, in communities. Um, so, so I would encourage uh, everyone to be wearing face coverings in inside environments where there, there is some level of risk and classrooms are certainly a, a great example of this. Uh, if you do not have uh, a face covering, then, then please get in touch with us and, and we'll make sure that we have a way of uh, making sure that you do have that. Uh, there are groups who are looking at square footage throughout campus and, and looking at the minimum square footage in lab spaces, minimum square footage in teaching classrooms and looking at the HVAC systems for each of all of the different the buildings to make sure that they're, they're appropriate. Uh, we're looking at the common lounge areas, cleaning practices, the buses that are used to go from one side of campus to the other, and, and looking at you know, reducing transmission across all of these different environments. As I mentioned before, there are many decisions that are not finalized yet or may even continue to change as new guidance rolls out. So for example, we don't know what the campus policy will be around testing for infective cases or testing for antibodies. Um, you know, will there be some kind of ongoing disease surveillance, not, not surveillance, but disease surveillance, uh, where people are tested and then the contract tracing is done on their closest companions? Um, will there be uh, other kinds of things like further guidance on face coverings? So we will continue to see that rolled out between now and August 10th. Uh, so here are some of the questions that were submitted in advance, and um, I, this some of them came from undergraduates, some of it, it came from graduate students. So let me address some of these, and then I see that there are a lot of questions that are coming through on the chat, chat function, so I'll turn to those as well. So some, some people have asked me what happens if they can't be on campus by August 10th, because they didn't arrange their housing to start until August 17th. So if, if that is the case, I am expecting that instructors will have a contingency plan that would allow you to still begin that class on August 10th like everyone else. And this is something that instructors are aware of this. Uh, they, they, um, they know that this might happen and, and they're trying to, to, to work with you on these kinds of things. As I mentioned, classes will be a mix of in-person, online, and hybrid. Right now in the priority offerings we, for graduate classes, we have the majority of them listed as a hybrid, which means that um, it would be mixed up. Some people would come on Tuesday, some people would come on Thursday, and that would rotate, and you would also be able to access the videos for the class. Uh, if any of the changes to the courses or the location assignments change the capacity, then we would certainly work with an individual student to make sure that any changes were addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and I don't anticipate uh, that happening. Um, we are encouraging all of the instructors to think about their absence policies carefully to make sure that when students do have uh, symptoms or feeling sick, that they have a way to quarantine or isolate when, when necessary to reduce that disease transmission. 
instructors are aware that that students will have fewer breaks and they you know they will certainly be taking that into account i'm not saying that the classes will be easier because you know instructors have certain expectations on um, the types of content that they want students to walk away from that class knowing um, but they are they are aware that you have fewer breaks and there may be a heightened level of stress or anxiety I do expect that those online and in-person classes will be balanced across the curriculum. Uh, I am still anticipating that some of the locations of classes could still change as the scheduling group works through the assignment of classes that are in-person or hybrid to appropriate classrooms for that. So right now, there may be some of your classes listed as being in Fitzwillard, some of them listed in Daniels, but I think we will continue to see changes on, on that on, over the next month. And as I mentioned, we don't have guidance yet on commencement. So um, some questions that have come specifically from graduate students, one is about deferral. If you choose to defer to uh, defer your admission that uh, was to start in August of 20, you can, you are allowed to defer that to January of 2021 uh, by working directly with our graduate program. Uh, you have the option of then deferring again if necessary. I believe that the preference is that you defer only one semester at a time rather than automatically deferring for an entire year. But I'll let, in a few minutes, I'll let uh, uh, Dr. Fatih, did you want to further answer? Because many of our students have already requested a whole year of deferment and we have approved it. The graduate okay. school normally approves, naturally approves up to one year without any particular uh, objection. And then if it goes beyond one year of deferment, then that may require special circumstances, which of course COVID-19 could well be one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We do not know the TA assignments yet. Uh, Dr. Fati and, and others are working through that uh, to, to make sure that we're assigning people to appropriate classes and we, we do anticipate needing a number of TAs for the fall. If you are interested in the MSOR, MSIE, there are ways to transfer between programs. I know that was asked in advance. Uh, you have to get approval from both programs to do that. So if that approval is given, then you, are, you would be allowed to transfer. So to do that, you know, the directors of graduate programs would be making sure to look at your record and, and that it's a fit and, and other things like that. Regarding the movement to Fitzwillard Hall, um, there are a number of delays right now around the HVAC system, the phones and internet, uh, and there are also um, concerns over the potential congestion if all of the classes were moved in there as planned. So we're not planning on being in the building on August 10th. Um, there may be a staggered move that occurs over the fall semester, uh, and we'll see closer to time what that looks like. Um, but right now, I don't anticipate that this will, would impact you too much. There are some questions that some of you had asked specific to international students. Uh, I do encourage you to make sure that you're checking the, the website of the Office of International Services, and they are really the experts on this, certainly not me, although uh, Dr. Fati knows more than, than I do in this space. Uh, I have seen that they have a great FAQ uh, that uh, outlines a number of things that some of you maybe uh, may, may have questions around. Uh, so for example, the rules around the internships are the same as they usually are. My understanding is that means that you have to be on campus for a full academic year before you would be eligible for uh, a, a, an internship during an ap academic semester. Uh, Dr. Fati, did I state that correctly or do you wanna to add to that? Even during the summer. Um, so it's not just during the academic year, but also during the summer. You have to be here a full academic year, even if you want to get a full internship during the summer. Thank you very much. If your I-20 needs changes, then, then OIS will be working with students. OIS have a, has a uh, member participating in the academic planning committee, so they're very well integrated with all of this. International students could choose to start classes online. So if they are not here in Raleigh in August uh, and they wanted to join online, then they could. They would have to pay tuition as they normally would and that would not count as being uh, on campus towards that, that um, the, the quantification that's used for the internship. <clears throat> if you're being paid as a TA, 
then you should be on campus. So that's, that's part of that as well. Now, let me go to some of the questions that are coming in on the chat function. Uh, just yes. One, with regard to international students joining online, um, I'm not sure if necessarily all of our courses are going to be online and whether or not uh, engineering online would have uh, facilities to manage such courses online in other countries, or at least not in all other countries. So it may not be really a feasible thing to do for international students to join online. I That's a great point. I taught, a, I recently taught a professional course where we had students sitting in Europe and Africa and all over the world. Um, students in the majority of the countries were able to participate in the professional education class that I was doing, but there were limits on the countries where there are export control restrictions. And so the students who were sitting in Sudan were not able to use the Zoom software that, that some of us use for our meetings or our classes. They were able to watch the videos on YouTube afterwards. So there was a workaround for the, the students in the professional class that were in some of the export controlled locations. But that one, I think um, if someone has further questions about it, then they can write to the grad office and we can make sure that we uh, have the right answer for their uh, environment. Um, if I may say also, the EOL also may, may have issues with regard to examine, examinations online in all countries. It's not just a matter of export control, but, but the question of whether or not they have examination facilities in other countries. So they need to have that in order for us to be able to uh, allow uh, international students to take a course online. So they're maybe more restrictive than just export. Yeah, thank you. So if that's something that is of interest to you, please write to Ms. Jas Jasmine Petway or to our general email for uh, graduate students and explore that to be sure if that, that's an option, if that's something that is of interest to you. First question, question from the chat box, if you can look with me at the chat box. I'm looking to start class in the fall. Uh, that person has a bachelor's in a different field, wondering how long it would take me to get my degree in IE. Uh, so uh, Dr. Fatih, can you answer that typically? That's a general question. Usually it takes two years to get a master's in IE if you have the proper background, but, but that's really not related to COVID situation in general. Your record has to be reviewed by our faculty and then courses have to be determined and so forth. The usual time for getting a master's degree in IE is two years. Mm -hmm. uh, and the person also asks if they can do it online or if they have to come to classroom sessions. We do have a, a master's in IE that is entirely online. And so that is a, a different admission process. It, you know, it's not different criteria, but it's just a different admissions process. And that is always available even during non-COVID-19 times. But our regular master's program, I assume, will not be available in that form because not necessarily all of our courses are going to be available online. And, and I'm not even sure if we, are, we already have any mechanism in place to have the entire program done online for on-campus students. So if you want to do the entire program online, it has to be to the, uh, at least so far as I know, to the engineering, well, to our online degree program. Our on-campus degree programs really have to be here in order to be able to, to participate in the program. And, and uh, we've also got Dr. Brandon McConnell on the line. I see that he is also providing some answers as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Brandon. Okay, I'm continuing. What are the plans to hold classes for international students who are unable to travel on time for start of fall 2020 due to travel restrictions and visa, visa issuance delays? The university is very well aware that um, uh, embassies have not opened up for interviews for visas yet. So we're very well aware that students may not be able to be here in August. So I think that this also depends on whether it looks like uh, someone could be here in September or October, or whether the person would not be able to arrive until January or later. And so that could look differently depending on who that is. Um, if it's the first, where there'll just be a few weeks late, I'm anticipating that our classes will have a way for people who can't be on campus as early as August 10th to have a way to access the materials for that class. 
But if someone can uh, not come until January or later, then we just have to make sure uh, that we're looking at, at all of the different degrees and making sure that, that it's the right um, program for that. Uh, Yaya, do you want to comment further? Yes, I would like to add just that, that we, have, we have not heard anything uh, for this year in particular, so there may be a changes, but in general, in previous years, if a student cannot be here by census day, which is usually 10 days into the semester, then they are not allowed to participate in that semester. They have to be physically here on campus in order to be able to participate. So the census day, if you start on August 10, I assume would be something around August 17 or 20th. Um, so uh, if, if you are not able to, to arrive here, if you ant do not anticipate to be here by that time, I assume the, the safest way would be to defer to a subsequent semester. I don't think at this time we have any instructions that the students are allowed to be here in September, October, or, or beyond, and yet participate in the fall semester. At participate in the, as an on-campus student. They I could think. still be in the online MIE degree and receive yeah. credit for courses. But if they're in online degree program and they have been approved as such, then of course, you know, their situation is already understood by the online program and they have arrangements for them to participate. Mm -hmm. Great. I will also make sure to bring this issue of the census date up to the committee and make sure that the census date, um, that there's, you know, a clear answer on what that will be for the fall since the initial date changed. Yes. Okay. Uh, next question, when approximately online classes will be now announced so someone can determine if they want to change any of their classes around. I'm not sure when it is going to be announced. I know that the process uh, first, there's information that's being gathered from departments on what the preference is for each of the classes. Um, and then all of this is put into uh, a large scheduling algorithm and optimization problem to assign uh, courses to classes. Right now, I believe that the plan is, the preference is, that the majority of graduate courses in ISE would have a physical presence. And right now, very few of them would be completely online. Uh, Dr. Fatih, do you want to comment further? I agree. Many of, in fact, the great majority of our courses are, are likely to be on campus. And in order to be uh, participating in those courses, you really have to be here. I don't see any alternative to it. OK. Um, next question, will it be mentioned on the degree that the student had taken the first semester online in case they do so? Uh, Dr. Fatih, if someone is first in the online MIE degree and then transfers to the on-campus, is that indicated on the degree? No, no. If they, they, the way they get their degree is really important. But of course, to transfer from one program to the other, if they have been admitted into the online program and want to transfer to the on-campus program, that's another admission process. It is not automatic. Our admissions committee has to look at that. And if they approve it and they come into that program, then of course, that would be the program from which they graduate. Whether or not it shows on the transcripts, of course, because some of the courses are online and they show on the transcripts. Mm -hmm. And here, I mean, there's not, it's not that online courses are easier than in-class courses. And uh, an online degree from a place like NC State is just as recognized as an in-person degree. At the end of the day, you're an alumni with a master's degree in IE. It's different than some of the universities that are 100% online, where, where they don't necessarily have the same level of instruction. But really, the majority of our online classes and, and in-person classes are the same. We actually have a few extra online, but, but many of them are the same. If I may add also a word that we do not have a PhD program online, because I see some of the questions coming from the PhD students planning to take their courses online. We, we simply do not have a PhD program online. The only program we have online is Master of Industrial Engineering. Okay. Uh, the next question, do we need a new I-20 as the date of commencement has been changed? Will the old I-20 be valid for visa appointment? Uh, Dr. Fatih, do you know the answer to that? I have no idea. Okay. The uh, immigration office and um, OIS might be able to. Yeah. I will make sure that, that I bring it up to um, the member on OIS so that they can add a, a question about it on their website. I will say that the date of commencement has not clearly changed yet. Um, that guidance hasn't been issued yet. 
um, but we will make sure to update you on what we find out from OIS about the I-20. Next question, uh, we've got someone working on thesis research that requires participants appearing in person and is concerned about the situation as well as a potential resurgence. What would be the recourse? So this is a good question. We certainly are not done with COVID-19. Uh, we can have a resurgence uh, this summer as well as in the fall. Um, now, one of the things that, that we were told uh, nationally is that you know, we, were, we were staying home initially to help flatten the peak and spread out the pandemic a little bit more to give us more time to prepare to enable us to have wider distribution and sufficient quantities of face coverings and masks, to make sure that hospitals were prepared to, to move forward, uh, to prepare business spaces, to, to make sure that they uh, could operate in a way that would also promote health and safety. So we are in a different place now if we do have a resurgence, which I am expecting. Uh, we are in a different place than we were back in, in March when things were, were just ramping up and we didn't have all of those preparations in place. Um, however, I would say that this, uh, this is something that we definitely need to, to look at further and, and talk with your advisor and see what kinds of options there might be uh, if, if, this, um, if there are limitations on human subjects participating. Okay. Okay, so here's a more general question from Navid to everyone. Uh, I've heard a lot about the excellence of manufacturing and supply chain domains of NC State ISE. Uh, this person is interested in pursuing IE with a focus on analytics. It would be helpful if you could talk about it, uh, not mentioned on the sites. And the, there's a further question about whether they can pursue something specific like OR with an analytics track. Great question. We have hired several faculty in the analytics area and we are starting to roll out more of those courses. So there is now a, a new course that was not on the books a couple of years ago. Uh, I would say that we have three faculty that we hired that have uh, significant expertise in this area, as well as some of our existing areas, uh, our, our existing faculty. Now on our website, this, it does not have a separate listing, but it is contained within the system analytics and optimization uh, area. So that's the one that, that you would want to look, uh, look at for um, information about taking courses in that space. And then as you're looking at the master's degree and the breadth requirements, there are also courses in computer science, statistics, operations research, as well as in ISC, and several of these could fit into this analytics area. The master's in IE does have a, it, it allows for a lot of choice in what you take, as long as you meet the breadth requirement, there's not a specific core that you have to take. So you would be able to focus uh, more, especially in the analytics area. I believe that is also the case for OR. And I think that both degrees probably need to do some uh, work on the website to make sure that that's clearer to students. Do you want to add anything further, Dr. Fati? Um, not really, thank you. Okay. The next one I think you'll, you'll be able to help answer. Does a hybrid program, assuming uh, they do fall 20 semester outside the US and join the campus in spring, enable them to roll in CPT for the summer? My understanding is no, uh, not right now, unless uh, policies change. And the policy here is not from the university, it's from uh, the State Department and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so the answer to that first question is no. And then secondly, will on-campus jobs be in operation if the classes start on campus? Yes, the answer to that one is yes. Uh, there may be different jobs in some cases and some may be, there may be more in some areas, there may be fewer, but there will be on-campus jobs in operation uh, when classes start on campus. Dr. Fati, any comments? Absolutely, I, I, I think uh, this is about all I have to say too, so no, I don't okay. Uh, the next question, the first part of it is about potentially deferring. And so the second half is, can uh, we throw some light on the class room size of the incoming batches? So I think this is really talking about how many graduate students are going to be here in fall of 20, how many graduate students will be here in spring of 21, in fall of 21, is, is my understanding. Uh, Dr. Vati, do you want to comment at all? Well, 
for the fall, I mean, we have uh, more or less a picture of how many we might get. Uh, obviously, less than what we expected, or half of what we expected, maybe even less. But for the spring and uh, fall of 2021, it's anybody's guess as to how things progress. Uh, at this moment, we do not have a projection. And for the fall, our total number of graduate students is pretty close to, to the same, but it's that we have fewer new students and more continuing students. Right. Yes, and this is this is true at, at universities um, everywhere, really. Uh, uh, but it is certainly true here as well. And we are looking just as forward as you are to the visa consulates uh, opening up for interviews. Now we have a question about qualifying exams. In regards to this year's qualifying exams, will the grading be less harsh because of the given situation? Dr. Fatih, do you want to comment on that? My expectation is that no, the grading would be at the same level. The structure of the exam might be a little bit different because of some of it being online potentially and some of it being in class. At the moment, the rules for that, uh, for the exams are being developed and I expect them to be released very soon. But, but to, the short answer is no, I do not expect it to be any less harsh or any more harsh than usual. It is just the same qualifying exam that is given every year. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did um, uh, change the assignment of exams to days to make it possible for students to switch which uh, topic, if they needed to switch which topic they were going to take or, or something like that. We did make it possible for you to make that change if you need to make that change. And we also start earlier because the semester starts earlier. Correct. But what I saw in the draft uh, program or, or schedule the first exam started on July 27th instead of... Yes, and faculty are aware that exams are, are starting earlier than they would have otherwise. They, they certainly are aware of that. I won't say specifically that the grading will be, you know, easier or harder because usually that it doesn't really work that way, but, but faculty are aware that you have fewer days in the summer. Okay, uh, we have an admittance for an MSIE program. This one was submitted at 158, and it's difficult due to the pandemic uh, for them to provide financial documents for the I-20. The unofficial date for it was till the end of May, but the situation is still not better to procure the financial documents. Will there be further extensions in deadlines for submitting the documents, or should they defer and do it at a particular term? Dr. Fatih, do you know the answer to that? My expectation is that probably no, because uh, that that time is usually set with the expectation of how long it takes to get the visa and travel and be here on campus. And, and if uh, these, the, the consulates are not open by that time, then the expectation would be that you will not be able to get the travel visa, even if you have the CFR. So my, my short answer is no, I do not expect any further extension. Okay, thank you. Obviously that depends on the university and not, not our office. Okay. The next question is from a first year student uh, that's to me and I will answer that one separately um, offline. Uh, let me just make a note of the name so I can uh, write about that. Okay, next one is at two o'clock. What are your views on new jobs and opportunities entering the market at the end of 2021 or later as people say the recession would end by that time? So, you know, right now there is a lot, uh, a lot that is unknown about uh, what's going to happen in different businesses. Uh, as you know, it's been a, a very disruptive time. Uh, we have seen some internships canceled, um, but we have not seen all of them canceled and um, we companies are still hiring. Um, I have asked my advisory board about some, some topics rel related to this. What I would say is that disruption also leads to innovation. And so one of our advisory board members, for example, left SAS and went to a small company that does, um, it oversees job applications for organizations like Costco, and they do this algorithmically online with technology. His business is booming because you can imagine that the uh, people applying to work at Costco has gone up and now they need to um, review two or three times as many applications as they would have before. And these applications number in the hundreds of thousands. 
So certainly ones that find ways to utilize technology and data will uh, continue to be possible. And um, you know, certainly the department is looking at what we can learn uh, from the disruption and what innovations that it will bring to businesses and operations. Uh, and, and we're talking with our alumni about that as well. So great question. Do you wanna add any more to that, Dr. Fati? Um, not really. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, now someone has an admission for MIE and the question is whether they can shift to the thesis option later on. Will you take that one? Sure, the answer is yes, that's generally true. Uh, it requires that you find an advisor and your thesis and so on. And, and uh, if you do, then of course that transition. Moving from one, pro one massive program to the other is done routinely by the students who find it in their interest as well as in their uh, um, feasible domain to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. The next one is at 201, and I'm going to, to forward this one to Dr. Fatih as well. If someone defers their admission, what will happen to their financial aid funds? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question for which I don't have an answer. Uh, it depends on the source of funding, obviously. Uh, we cannot guarantee that it will be available, but we will. that is at least what I've heard from our department as well as from the college, that we will try our best to honor those but next year's budget is next year's budget and we don't have it at this time. So we cannot guarantee that it will be there, but it will, we will do our best to, to uh, honor those as much as we can within our budgetary guidelines and limitations. Thank you. Will the credits vary for online courses compared to on-campus courses? And will the fees per credit vary if they pursue the online method for classes? The credit hours do not vary, and, and the majority of our courses are, you know, say three credit hours, um, and, and those do not vary. Uh, do you, Dr. Fati, do you know about the fees per credit uh, for online degrees versus not? I do not. I do not. We'll, we'll look for the website to that, or, or you can look for it. Um, I know that there is a slightly different funding um, metric, but I, I don't think it's significantly different. But if I may add, if, if a student is already admitted in the online program, then there is an office of online program that will tell them that information and they have already told them that information. If, it's, if that question is coming from someone who is an on-campus student, well then that's really a different question. I believe on-campus students are not allowed to take online courses unless with a special permission and if they do, it will be just like an on-campus course. Okay. Okay, next one, if a fully, this one looks like uh, paying the usual tuition. If a fully funded international student is unable to join fall semester on time due to visa, visa issuance delays, and he, she chooses to take online courses, would they have to pay the usual tuition? And the answer is yes. I have gotten a clear yes uh, in the past. Dr. Prati? Same, same thing with me. I have gotten a clear yes on answer on that one. Yes, if, they, if you participate, if you want to take an online course, you will pay the tuition yourself. The, uh, even if you have had a, an offer of financial support, we cannot honor those financial support packages unless you're physically here on campus. If the government decides to change the OPT rules, can they change it for an ongoing batch of students too, or can they change rules only for the next batch and batches that come after that? So I think they can do anything they want on OPT rules. Dr. Fati? I agree with you. Yeah. Now, I have heard rumors about changes to OPT, but I can tell you that companies and universities are going to be very opposed to, to changes. And so what they will probably do is talk a lot about it and make lots of noise. But at the end of the day, I suspect that the changes will be less than what it seems like from the initial words. But that, I mean, that's a conjecture. Um, so, so that's, that's my answer to that one. I am watching it carefully because, uh, you know, I, I won't be very happy either. Uh, next half of that question, are we anticipating a second wave of infection? What actions are we taking for it? I am anticipating not just a second wave. I mean, you know, there are different parts of the country and, and different 
places right now. So New York is in a very different place than North Carolina is. Even New York City is in a different situation than rural New York. Uh, we are anticipating additional infections here. We are more well prepared now than we were back in March. We have uh, much more personal protective equipment. We have uh, more information about treatments. We have our hospitals and doctors prepared. Uh, we have more testing available than we had back in March. There are really many different things in that space. And of course, the majority of uh, students, both undergraduate and graduate, are likely at low risk. Uh, the people who are at higher risk tend to be the faculty or staff. Uh, but there are, you know, a, a number of things that are that are being done throughout the state and the campus to uh, reduce transmission and to uh, improve outcomes uh, across the board um, for the, the pandemic response. Okay, so now we've got someone who has an admittance for the MS and IE. They also are passionate about management degree uh, courses. They've heard about the dual degree and would like to know more about it and how do they enroll for it? Dr. Fati? Um, I really don't have a good answer for that. If you want to be, we have a dual uh, IE and management degree program, but for that you need to actually apply for it. What's the question? I didn't quite... Uh, I'm not yeah, they want to know more about the courses. Well, I know a little bit more about the courses, the fee structure, and how do, how do they enroll. It is possible to apply for this before you come. It is possible to apply to transfer and basically add in that extra degree after you get here. I do recommend that. I recommend starting an MSIE and then adding on the MBA. Um, there are some courses that are essentially uh, jointly counted and there are other courses that are in either engineering or MBA. Uh, it does have a premium tuition, as most MBA degrees do, and that is the reason that if you're already admitted into MSIE, I would recommend you start in MSIE, and there's a specific semester where it makes sense to apply for and add on the MBA degree. Mike Kay knows a lot about that. Dr. Kay is an advisor for master's students and has regularly worked with students who are interested in this dual degree option. Yes. If most students defer their admittances, will the spring and fall semesters 21 have a potentially larger intake? And will the student to faculty ratio change? Dr. Fati? I would expect that to be the case. Yeah, I, we, I mean, there, I, I agree. Uh, but right now, for example, we may, take, we may end up with a few more undergraduates and a few fewer graduate students. And then in spring or fall next year, we could end up with more graduate students. Um, we have the option of hiring adjunct instructors to help uh, keep that student to faculty ratio uh, reasonable. And we do that particularly for specific courses where we want to bring in uh, extra expertise. So we have several of those that we can add if we, if we need to. Next question. Where should a prospective TA arrive on 10th of August for instruction? If earlier than that, then when? And will there be stationary workplaces like cubicles or tables available to the TA? Dr. Fati? Normally, when a student arrives, first goes to OIS to register their arrival, and then they come to the department graduate office um, to uh, make sure that they're aware of all the First of all, the graduate office is aware of their arrival, and then they're aware of all the information that they need to have. So those are the first two places they go. First, they go to OIS to register their arrival from the visa point of view, and then they come to ISE graduate program office. Um, in particular, Ms. Jasmine Petway would be there to welcome them and uh, register their arrival. And then um, I, I believe that we do have an office uh, that we make available for students who are TAs. Yes. So with they cubicles, tables, yes. et cetera. Mm -hmm. Next question, will these restrictions be rolled back to normal during fall 2021 or is that a hybrid system too? So I'm not sure what these restrictions mean. Uh, if it's about, like for example, the rules about when you're allowed to do an internship are always in place. Those come from federal agency and, and they don't change. Um, if you're talking about classes, whether classes are online, in person or hybrid, I would say that fall 2021 is too far ahead for us to really know. 
Um, right now, of course, my hope is that the pandemic would be done by then, uh, but anything can happen. Uh, if I did not understand that question correctly, uh, please add something more to your, your question in the chat box and we'll see if we can uh, address that more completely. Now, the second part of your question, what is the current COVID situation in North Carolina? Will it get better by August? And, and Ms. Welton, Karen Welton, would you mind uh, finding the dashboard for DHHS for North Carolina and adding it to the chat box? The current COVID situation in North Carolina is very different than the COVID situation in Illinois, New York, Massachusetts. It, it's just very different. We're at a very different um, spot with respect to the disease. Uh, the total, I've estimated the total infections in North Carolina so far, and I estimate the total infections that we've had in North Carolina are less than 5% of our entire population. Whereas in New York, it may be 30% or even higher in New York City. So we haven't had near the number of infections or percent of infections that they've had in New York. Will it get better by August? Um, I don't know that the COVID situation in North Carolina will get better because right here in terms of number of cases, you know, the hospitals are not overwhelmed, the testing centers are not overwhelmed. So I don't think that that's uh, a concern in North Carolina. Now, will the virus go away by August? I think the answer is no, and I think that that's true around the entire world. I don't think there's anywhere in the world where it's going to go away by August. And scientists even say that we may be living with this for years, circulating to some degree. It's the worst right now because no one has any immunity to it, uh, but it may continue to circulate for longer time periods. Um, so it, it is certainly not a terrible situation in North Carolina. Uh, there are some restrictions on what restaurants are, are uh, how many people they can have in them and um, what the way that a barbershop uh, operates for haircuts. Um, but we're not in the same place that, that New York is right now. Uh, next one, if I defer my admission to spring 21, can they complete their MSIE degree in summer 20 instead of spring 23? 2.5 year degree instead of two as the job opportunities in summer, fall are comparatively more than the spring. Dr. Fati? You're still muted. How far you go? I did, I'm sorry, I'm on the mute. Whoops, you're still muted. Okay. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Um, it depends on how fast you go in terms of taking courses required for your program. But in general, taking some, some students take two and a half years to finish their master's program. That is not totally unheard of. So it is possible, I assume. Uh, but that obviously requires you to, to pay more tuition. That means five semesters instead of four. Yeah. And, and you can plan your credits per semester, or you could take some extra courses and, and you just don't, don't get your degree before that time period. Is that that's, correct? That's true. That's true. And you know, of course, if you're an international student, you're required to take a minimum number of courses each semester that you're here, mm -hmm. um, except for maybe the last semester that you only take the courses that you're required. But if you don't take all the courses that are required for your degree, you won't graduate. If you do take all the courses required for your degree, you do graduate. And that's really then the answer is obvious, right? <laughs> and how do okay. you- Thank you. Can I use all of my transcripts from different schools or only the transcripts from the university they graduated from when they enroll? Dr. Fati? Transcripts, I'm not quite sure. Like, well, like maybe they spent two years at one school and then transferred the credits to a different school and then graduated from the second school. Well, so. Course. The transcripts need to be submitted at the time that uh, they apply for admission. At the end, they get a degree from one school, and that degree must be submitted to the university's official um, uh, receiving office. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Now, now, let me also point out while you're thinking about whether there are any last minute questions, We've also got some current students uh, who are on the line here and let me in, invite them to come off of mute 
and make themselves available to answer any questions if, 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 if they feel comfortable doing that. Um, although you may have um, different questions than what they may have expertise in. Okay, I don't see any more questions coming in. I thank you for participating today. I think I thank Dr. Fatih for his uh, expertise as well and for joining us. Um, uh, we will let you know if there are any further updates. And, and for some of you, I do encourage you to check the website of OIS, the Office of International Services, and I will correspond with them as well to make sure that they add a couple of things to their website. Uh, and if you have additional questions about the graduate program, um, is Jasmine Petway, and there's an email address specific to the graduate program that, that you can use, uh, and that will help you get your questions answered in a timely manner. Thank you, thank you very much, and, and thank you for your patience with all of this. I know it is a trying time. Uh, and we will make this recording available after we're done. Uh, we will post it probably on the grad section of our website. Thank you, uh, Jasmine, who's on the line now. I didn't realize it. Thank you for providing your email address. Right. And we've got some faculty on the line as well, Dr. Rohan Shearwaker, Dr. Karen Chen. We have quite a large group. I, I tell you, we have more graduate students that came uh, than we had undergraduates. So maybe you have more questions. <laughs>